And reading there in 1 Thessalonians, right at the beginning of the book, Paul had these words for us. This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We are writing to the church in Thessalonica, to you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God give you grace and peace. We always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly. As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. As a result, you have become an example to the believers in Greece throughout both Mesopotamia and Achaia. And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For, whatever, for wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it, for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy and perfect word. This November, as Americans, we have the honor, the privilege of casting our vote. And in Pennsylvania, among those things that we are voting for, of course, are U.S. Senate and governor, and of course, many other local elections. We are blessed to live in this nation where we have the privilege when many around the world do not have such freedom. And so it is wise, as Dave already suggested on our prayer time, that we pray for our upcoming elections. We pray for wisdom and discernment. Uh, encourage all of us by prayer and petition to say, who should we vote for? So who am I going to vote for? Well. I'm going to vote for who I always vote for. In my opinion, the candidate that most reflects God's perfect will. And so I would encourage all of us to seek God's spirit, to reflect on candidates that would reflect uh, the message of his holy word. And I'd, I would pray that God would give us discretion and discernment as we do that. Because as a follower of Jesus Christ, it is our obligation that Jesus is Lord everywhere. Not only is he Lord in every aspect of our life, but also, of course, in how we vote. And so this November, it's important to elect those people that can lead our nation. And so I encourage us all to do so. But as I say that, I want us to carefully remember an important fact. Although we can elect people and they can do wonderful good things, our hope can never be in the government or in politics. It must be only found in Jesus Christ. And largely, if we read the Gospels, we will find that Jesus largely stayed out of political matters and focused on his kingdom, which is of vast more importance. And so as followers, we are called in many ways to do the same. One of the times that Jesus got somewhat political, of course, was when he was confronted about um, paying taxes to Caesar, which was, of course, a trick, trying to get him to say one thing or the other, and so they could ensnare Jesus no matter what he answered. But when they asked him about paying, he asked to see a coin. They showed it to him and he asked, whose face is on this? They said, Caesar's face. Yeah, then give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto God the things that are God's. The faces of money and currency are always changing. This, unfortunately, this week, England uh, lost their monarch, Queen Elizabeth. And so, uh, is their custom, they will get new currency. The queen's face will no longer be on their money, but instead replaced with their new king. You see, the faces on money will always change. It's just a piece of metal or a piece of paper, in our case, stamped with an appearance of someone. When God's appearance is stamped on all of creation, and it is far greater and of greater value, God will always sit on the throne. So why didn't Jesus take this moment to jump all over the great sins of Caesar, who were many? 
the blasphemy that Caesar referred to himself as a deity, as a god, um, that he uh, did many unsavory uh, sexual things. Um, he encouraged the babies just that could be left out in the streets to die. Um, he butchered many people in horrific ways. Why didn't Jesus take that opportunity? Some have suggested in some commentaries that Jesus was perhaps afraid. That's nonsense. Of course, Jesus was not afraid of any political person. It's absurd. In fact, we remember a short time later at his own trial when Pilate says, don't you understand the power that I have over you? <laughs> and Jesus retorts, you have no power except what is given to you. See, the power that any of us have is only granted to us from God. So no matter who we elect, and we should carefully decide who it is the best candidates to elect, but those people will not change the course of the world. What changes people and their course of eternal destiny is whether they accept or reject Jesus Christ as both Savior and Lord. And that is the mission and function of his church, to focus not on the kingdom of this world, because the kingdoms of this world will always rise and fall. I'm sure that, as all people are, the people living in those days of the Roman Empire could never foresee a time in which the Roman Empire would fall. And yet it did, as all empires and all nations do. Because no nation or empire is ever eternal. But the kingdom of God is always going to be eternal and will last for all time. It will rule not only in this age, but in the age to come forever. And so, with that in mind, I want to suggest that the most important leadership that we can address and look at is not just civil leadership that we so often focus on, but church leadership, because it is the thing that can fundamentally transform individual lives. The world will not be changed as much as politics, but by people who make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, who allow themselves to be discipled and become disciples of Him, and to lead other people to do likewise. And so I ask that we would pray for our national Christian leaders, for our denominational Christian leaders, for the pastors, for our church councils and their elected officials. Pray that men and women are godly, that they're sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, that we seek earnestly and truly the will of God. Because the church as it functions as the bride of Christ is something that can last forever. And so we pray, not only for those who are currently in any of those leadership positions, whether they're national or local or congregational, now and for the future, because that's what Jesus wanted us to do. He led by example, that's what he does. Now, Jesus wasn't always happy with those who were leading in his day, was he? In fact, he had some pretty harsh words to say to the Pharisees at various times. He said, among other things, they were non-caring, publicity hounds, seeking their own gain. They put on a smile on the outside, but inside they were rotted. Their descendants, he called them murderers and snakes. He had a lot more to say about them than he did about the Herods and the Caesars of their day. I guess let the evil empires of their day judge themselves by the evil and corruption that they did. But Jesus started with the spiritual leaders. And that should concern us because we are called to be the spiritual leaders of our culture, to be accountable for him, that I am accountable to God for everything that I do and say. And in the same way, just not because of just my position, but we are all accountable to God for the things that we do and say. But as Jesus said, follow me. That we are all called to follow him, that our calling is very clear just to pursue him and what he has for us. So it is natural here in our text, we see that Paul and Silas and Timothy are saying to the church there in Thessalonica, follow us as we follow Jesus. Teach us to be more like Jesus and to follow him for that is our calling. It's the reason we are given life. It is the reason we draw breath. It is the reason that God has put us here. And so it is so important that we elect and bring out leaders that are reflective of that, who are seeking God's word because leadership is not about speeches. It is not a, 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 a about appearances. It is about building relationships of teaching people to be like Jesus. That's why in our passage, look at the number of times that Paul uses the words we, us, our. It is community. It is 
people functioning together, living together for their sake. To understand this passage, rather, we have to look at where does this occur um, in, in the timeline of the New Testament. It's occurring right after, if we looked at in, in Acts chapter 17, uh, this is just after uh, Barnabas and Paul were together, and then they had that dispute about John Mark. Barnabas said, let's bring John Mark uh, back in. Paul's like, no, he deserted us once. I don't want to bring him. Barnabas, let's forgive him. I'm going to take him and uh, go somewhere else. And Paul's like, okay, I'm going to take Silas and go somewhere else. So this is where he went. They found Timothy. They went there to Thessalonica and they start teaching there in the Jewish synagogues for about three weeks there. Um, and they're explaining to them why Jesus really is the Messiah to the people there. And it's, it's received well. There's a lot of Jewish people and Gentile people and a lot of women who come to accept Jesus as Savior and Lord that the, the, the doors of the kingdom are wide open to so many. And Paul talks about in Acts that he's not the world's greatest order, he's not the world's greatest speaker, but he has the Holy Spirit there to guide him. And in just three weeks, he's making a difference. And, and those words and those speeches are important, and, and they are the truth, and they are the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are vastly important, but they were not the totality of the work that was done there. Because look at what Paul is saying here. In our letter that we read about, Paul was thanking the people for remembering their faithful work for their genuine love, for their enduring hope. How does he know to say that? Because he knows these people. He's invested time with them. He understands who they are. That is what he did as a leader, to invest in the lives of the people that are around them, to build those relationships over time. It does take time, yes, but if we wanna say we minister to students, well then we have to understand students. <laughs> We have to enter their world. The same thing with children and their parents. To understand that the world is not just about being in a classroom, but about real life. And asking the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. And again, those things take time. But that old adversary, Satan, is a liar. And he will whisper into our ears all sort of lies and distractions. Because the world will say, just be busy, but not be productive. How many times are we just busyness doing nothing? How many times do you turn on the TV and you scroll for 15 minutes and decide, ah, nothing's on? How many times do you say, I got a question, I look at my phone. 25 minutes later, you went down rabbit hole after rabbit hole after rabbit hole. And it's like, well, I didn't know that that was the World's Fair in 1963, I'll be. You know, and you just are doing nothing, nothing productive. And yet, that is our call. We just distract ourselves from being present in the moment. But that is what God has called us to be. Present, focusing on worshiping Him, being there to connect with His family, finding identity in who we are. So many times we find identity, who are you? And we've answered in all kinds of ways. Many people answer with their job. You know, I'm a nurse, a teacher, I work for the state, I'm a pastor. Eh, those things come and go. They're just titles of jobs. Who you really are is a follower of Jesus Christ. That's going to follow you forever. And so it is right to find our identity in Christ. That's why um, Paul is talking to us about the leaders here, about people who are shepherding the flock, being an example, not doing things for selfish reasons, serving as an overseer, investing in the lives of other people. See, one of the great tragedies, in my opinion, of the modern American church is that we have somehow taught people that deacons and elders are people who make budgets and decisions, who monitor buildings and funds. Nothing could be further than the truth from the New Testament church. The New Testament church, the word deacon comes from the word to serve, to be among the people of God for who they are, identified not by title, but by lifestyle, connected and serving the people, living out the power, love, and truth of Jesus Christ by everything in their lives. That elders are people who focus on the worship of God and leading people into relationship with Him. And although those other things need to be done, they cannot be the focus of the church, at least not as Jesus defines it. Focus more on getting people to become disciples of Jesus more than Robert's rules of order. Leaders in the church have the purpose that the church is here to worship God, to teach truth, and develop relationships with one another so that we can reach the lost. Titles don't make the individual. Individuals make titles. 
Live for Jesus, and whatever title people want to give you is fine, but what title God gives you is most important. Live in this way, make disciples, baptize them, teaching them to grow. The purpose of the church has not changed in 2,000 years, and I dare say it will never change. Technologies, methodologies, those things will change. But Paul reminds us that it is our job to empower others to do ministry, to convict them and encourage each one of us to study God's word so we know what it says, and then to connect with God by praying. It is God's will then, then that we reproduce others as we follow Him, teaching them to follow as well. The goal of each one of us should be that we are pursuing and becoming more like Jesus and less like the world. Put away everything that we think is more important to us than Jesus so that as Paul says, look at them. See how they model their faith. That it is an example for others. To ask ourselves, is my faith worth modeling? If someone were to model me right now, would they look more like Jesus or would they look more like the world? And if we don't give people the real Jesus, at best all we'll develop is people that attend church, which I love that all of you attend church, but we're not ever going to develop real disciples who people's lives are transformed by the very real Jesus Christ. Paul reminding the Thessalonians, and he's reminding us that he has saved us. Jesus has of the upcoming wrath, that he raised us from death itself, and he is continuing to grant new life to all who would seek him. If we are a child of God, if we are truly his disciple, let us never lose what is most important, our purpose. There is no line of demarcation for the Christian, no lines of separation and compartmentalization between work and home and church. You are a follower of Jesus Christ wherever you are. There's no different. You are given those things. You are given a home life. You are given a job. You are given those things in order to do one thing, to glorify God. And that is the purpose of all of those things. In America, even in the church, we have so often, it seems to me, undermined children. We often have this idea that they should shut up and pay attention. And yeah, sometimes people's behavior lacks maturity, manners, or respect. But isn't it more important to look past those things, to look at what really matters is the need for Jesus? Why aren't they paying attention? Sometimes maybe they're just bored. And hey, Sometimes kids are just more honest than adults. <laughs> Maybe some of you are bored right now. I hope not. But hey, because the point of being here isn't to listen to me ramble on for a while, even to sing some beautiful songs that Linda and Robin lead us in. The point of all of this is to worship God, which prepares us for everything else. Because this isn't the focus. This is the pregame. This is the preamble. When we walk out those doors, that's where life is. And that's where we are called to live for God, to be on mission and purpose for Him. That's why Jesus says, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. When we get involved with things in church, doing, not to say things in church, things that God has laid on your heart, the gifts and talents that He has given to you to be used in the body of fellowship, you will be blessed. So what is God laying on your heart? What gifts and talents and skills has he given you? And how do you use them to advance his kingdom? And if you haven't yet figured that out, come talk to me. Maybe we have something. Maybe you have a new idea of something that God is calling you to do. Well, pray about it. And then let's put our heads together with all the people who are elected leaders in the church and see what we can do to meet those needs and fulfill them. See, the only thing that's going to really radically change the world is not elections, in my opinion, but it is the church being the church. People functioning and following Jesus Christ who wish to reflect God's will more than anything else in life. And so, I ask that we take that charge seriously. And while it is so important that we do elect good government officials, it is much more important that we pray for and lead not only our civil authorities, but our church authorities. That we seek to put people in good positions locally, 
nationally, denominationally, that we pray for our leaders, we pray for the pastors, we pray for each one of us who is called to lead in some way, and that we put aside everything else that isn't making God first. Because at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, we're going to look back and say, why didn't I? Because those are the things that are really, truly going to matter. Let us pray. Father God, you have been so good to us. You have been so kind to gift people in so many different ways. You have given people very practical skills. You have given people the ability to move screens, to sing, to help with budgets, to help uh, do grounds works, to, to help teach Bible studies. You have given us so many gifts and skills, and yet there are so many skills and abilities that are untapped. Help reveal them to us. Help us to say, is there anything in our lives that needs to be removed so that our focus is more clearly on you? Then help us individually and collectively to see and to seek you more clearly. Then help us have the courage and commitment to see you for who you are. Help us to vote this year as you wish us to vote. But help us to understand that the most important thing that we can do is to follow your will. Help us to keep our focus upon you. In Jesus' holy name, amen.